my talk today is called uh, The Exquisite Apocalypse, which is uh, intentionally uh, paradoxical, oxymoronic maybe. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the weather outside puts a little bit more emphasis on the apocalyptic part of it, but <laughs> the idea is, is, is that these things both exist together. And as Californians, as humans in the 21st century, we're sort of living this every day. Today is a really extreme example. Um, and by context, what I mean by this is um, I'm talking about, of course, the environment and the way that we live in the environment these days and how do we behave in this environment um, because it's difficult. Um, one, one of the pieces of art or the concepts and metaphors, the cliches that I thought perfectly embodied this and the way I feel when I'm trying to write about this is this classic image of uh, Emperor Nero playing the, the lyre while Rome burns because what do you do when you see your city on fire? Um, how, do you, how do you behave? And, and, and Shakespeare was the first one to mention that this is what he chose to do. He was the leader and he chose to play a song. And scholars have contested what this means for centuries. Um, and it's been debunked, uh, the significance of this or whether it even happened at all. But um, I thought it was kind of fitting because I often feel like I'm at a loss for how to behave in the face of, of environmental degradation and climate change. So if you came here uh, expecting me not to talk about climate change as, as a, a real thing, and I'm sorry to disappoint you. So this project, Bioregions Extinction and the Braided Essay, came about because there's this amazing conference that happens every other year. It's called ASLI. And ASLI is the Association for the Study of Literature and the Environment. And it's, it began right about when I got my master's degree at Davis. I was part of the literature, uh, nature and culture, program that started there and it was, a, it was a, a joint effort between the creative side of UC Davis, the English department, and then the biology and bio, I guess it's just the natural sciences side. And so they would intentionally stick students together to talk about ways that they could influence each other in their fields. And it was really a rich place to learn. So this conference kind of came around at the same time and it's been going ever since. I love it. I'd encourage you all to try to check this out this summer if you are in the area and it's not blanketed in smoke as it is now. Um, but I'm going to be up here presenting. Uh, this is my fourth time at ASLI. Uh, it's a great, great conference. You can learn a lot of things there. There's, uh, there's opportunities for artists there. There's opportunities for traditional scholars of literature and the environment and, and scientists. So it's really, it's really fantastic. Anyway. <laughs> Appropriate topic, Paradise on Fire for this time. That was, that's the theme of the, of the, of the thing. And because I'm, I'm my, on my panel, I represent uh, this region. Um, that's, the, that's the title of my piece, Exquisite Apocalypse. The title of, of our panel is that. My title for my piece is called The Fire Triangle. And those of you who've taken firefighting here, you know what the fire triangle is, right? The three elements that build a fire. Wait, what are they? Who can tell me? Oxygen, fuel, Spark, right? So you need three things. If you don't have one of those things, the whole thing doesn't work. So mine's called the fire triangle, and you'll understand why that's important as I talk more about the form of the essay and the panel presentation that we're going to give, because it's called a braided essay. Okay, so first of all, uh, my portion of the panel is bioregional, and you have to know that bioregional is the, is the study of an area, a place, and the natural aspects of that place and human beings' relationship to that place. And for the last 20 years, I have located myself in, in many senses in this part of California, the central coastal redwood forest. So this is where I currently live. I commute from this place to come here to work. Um, it's definitely not an easy commute, but I love where I live and I love where I work. And so the commute itself is not a big deal to me. The things you need to know about it is it's a very specific region and every year that there are fires, it shrinks. Um, we just had a fire last week that took out six acres uh, just down the road from me and it was only because Cal Fire was right on the scene that it didn't turn into something worse. So we're 2,000 feet up. We're 30 minutes north of Santa Cruz, 30 minutes south of San Jose. So we're, I actually think of myself as sort of half robot, half hippie. <laughs> this is kind of like that. We're literally right on the middle. Um, is kind of perfect for me uh, um, as a person, as identity. Um, but I, in living up there for the last five years and actually spending time up there for the last 20 years, 
um, I've come to know a lot about the nature in that area. Um, and learned, and I'm very interested in native species and in, in sort of halting the, the, the influx of invasive species up there. And as I walk with my daughter almost every day, we notice the way that things change and the way that certain plants and animals tend to come and go. And so here are some of the, the native flora and fauna of my region, and these are the things that I watch, I watch for every day when I walk and I try to learn about. I draw these plants, I try to draw these animals. And I want them to inform my artistic work. Uh, and my background is in poetry. And so I'm really, really trying to write about more in a more pastoral sense. It doesn't always work. I'm a child of Silicon Valley. That's where I grew up. So, but the more that I learn about these things, the more they feel like it, I'm infused by this bioregion. And I really want it to inform my work. So this is one of the reasons why I, I'm so interested in literature and the environment. Unfortunately, we also have a real problem with fire up where I am. Um, over the last 20 years, we've lost about two-thirds of our coast live oaks to uh, sudden oak death, and the, the wood borer beetle gets in there and, and takes them down. We've learned that the bay tree is uh, a carrier of this pathogen, which also has infected our madrone trees. A lot of those are drying out. And over the last five years, our Douglas firs, some of which are as large as the redwood trees, have started to dry up and lean, and which, which is not a good thing. Um, some of these trees are hundreds of years old, and they're, they're, de they're dead. Um, so uh, fire every year between the months of like August and now, um, we hold our breaths, and it's terrifying. Um, so this is what we faced two years ago. This smoke column right there, if you can see it, was about a mile away from my kids' uh, elementary school. And this is what the fire looked like at night taken from the Santa Cruz Pier. So there's a palpable tension in my neighborhood right about this time of the year. This was not the case uh, up until about 10 years ago. We didn't think about this kind of thing. It was a once in a lifetime event. And now it just seems like it's, a, it's just a, a yearly stressor. Um, and it's definitely, that tension is definitely something I'm trying to capture in my writing. This was yesterday. I, I was prepared to come in here and say, like, look how bad it can get. Do you remember yesterday? And then I drove to work today and I thought, holy shit, it's worse today. So this is, this is the apocalyptic part of things that, that scare me. And the, and the frequency with which these things happen lately is just sort of intensifying my anxiety about, and, and it's actually fueling the question in my mind, like what is it, how do we behave in this environment? How do we, how do we, how do we exist, I mean, let alone create in this environment? So <laughs> question that comes up to me <laughs> is, is it, even, is it even appropriate or relevant to try to make art in what seems to be a, an apocalyptic environment? And I've got to admit, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a child of the age of anxiety. I definitely feel like I wake up on the wrong side of the bed in this area, as I'm sure some of you may as well. But a word I wanted to bring up here is the Anthropocene, which is a big trendy word in lit of the environment circles. And it basically just means that it's the age when human activity is the most sort of notable part most notable definition of the place, especially, I mean, in regard to climate and the environment. So the anthro, which means people, is the age of people and what we've done to the environment. And so in this age, which seems to be not such a hot one, maybe, maybe that's the wrong word, how do, we, how do we get up in the morning? How do, we, how do we decide to do the work that we do, especially if it's creative? And in some ways, it goes back to the idea is when you decide to write in the, about this type of situation, in this type of situation, are you essentially becoming Nero? At the best, you're not really making much of a difference. It's, it's, not really, it's not really affecting anything. And at the worst, it can almost seem, especially if you're privileged, uh, like, I, like I am, is you're taking pleasure in the misfortunes of others. If your house burns down and I don't have to, and, it, and, it, and my house doesn't, then, um, then do I celebrate, you know? So it's complicated. So yeah, this is all gloom and doom. No, I don't want it to be gloom and doom. Where's the exquisite part of the apocalypse? How do you, how do you pull yourself out of this and be like, yeah, let's just redouble our efforts and run back at things creatively? 
And I go back to my, my critical thinking class, which the longer I teach it, the more I feel like it really does have the potential to save people. Because what it reminds me of is that when we have a choice for thinking between, say, a dualistic situation, like we're all going to burn, or no, I'm going to do something, I'm going to make a difference, I'm going to change things. You don't, a lot of times the easier way is just to tune out, right? When you have a choice for thinking, I tell my freshmen this every year, it's scary. You feel like an imbalance in your mind, and that imbalance makes you feel vulnerable. And so, but at that point, you have a choice. You can ignore it, run away, you know, watch TV, have a drink, do the things that we do to sort of not deal, get on the phone. Yeah, the disequilibrium goes away, but at the end result is that you feel a lost sense of power. And the next time you have to make a decision like that, you feel very ill-equipped. And so what I tell my students is that when you choose to think actively and critically, the same thing happens. Your equilibrium comes back. You get over that hump of whatever it is you're trying to do. I always give the example of calculus, right? You get over that hump. You do the problems. It might take 10 hours, but you get it done. And the result of that is you feel powerful. And power in the sense is not the, not the sense that you have power over something. It's a sense of agency. It's a sense that you have, a, you have an effective um, way of, of acting, OK? So I thought, well, this is a really good opportunity for me to practice what I preach and try to think critically about what I'm trying to do here. Another thing that occurred to me was, as I was thinking critically, was that a lot of times when we're presented with a situation that seems like it's black and white, that we really have to re-embrace the concept of paradox and be comfortable with having two opposing ideas in your mind at the same time. I tell my students this too. Hallmark of a good critical thinker is that you're able to appreciate paradox. Okay, you don't, you don't fall into this sort of binary of um, it's a duck, it's a rabbit, it's a duck, it's a rabbit. Well, which is it? Okay, it's both. And the extent to which you can become comfortable thinking of both of those things at the same time, the better critical thinker you'll be. You will not be as, you will not be as extreme in your, in your rationale. And I definitely am one of these people. I will definitely say that is a duck. And, and that's, that's not good. That's not good for art. That's not good for, that's not good for science. That's not good for thinking. So here's my big question. Does my art transcend or reinforce environmental degradation? This is, this is a classic universalist paradox. Um, does it, in doing the thing that it's trying to do, does it do the opposite thing <laughs> instead? You know, it's like the grand irony of life. You just never want to feel like you're, you're at cross purposes with yourself. And so this is a paradox that I am struggling with. Paradoxes play an ambiguous, dare I say, paradoxical role in research. While they may be engines, they're almost as often brakes. It's not easy to, to think critically when you don't feel like you have any clue how to grasp the, an answer. Paradoxes sit uneasily with the precept that theories must be consistent, conclusions logical, decisions rational. The more we try to be rational about attacking a paradox, uh, the, the harder it is. When we begin with paradoxes, we are expected to resolve them. So I think the first thing I had to do when I was thinking about this issue is try to ease off the brakes as far as solving the problem. Am I helping? Am I hurting in my art? Um, and so easing back off of that solution, which is hilarious because in English 100 when we teach writing, the first thing we think about is we've got to have a thesis, right? You've got to have an answer before you before you solve the problem. You've got to already have a hint, okay? So easing off that is not something that, you know, people like me, who I tend to be a little, like, I like to organize things and put things in boxes, um, that I'm really that good at. So here's the thing where the form of something that you create can, can help, okay? And so the, the essay that I referred to at the beginning of my talk for this ASLI conference is a conceptual essay, okay? It's something that, that my partners and I, my colleagues, thought about before we started to, to write. And part of it was informed by this idea that we don't really know what the answer to this question is. Perhaps the an there is no answer. Perhaps the best thing to do is to, is to think of it as a paradox and, to think, and think about ways that we can encourage ourselves to create that don't require answers. And what we, what we stumbled on was this form called the braided essay. Has anybody ever heard of this? Okay, 
A braided essay, the braid is the, is the central metaphor, right? You have strands. So any of you guys are, you know, ever braided people's hair, you know you have three strands normally, and each strand is its own distinct thing. And then the strands interact with each other in a pattern to where in the end you have one thing that's made up of three, okay? So a braided essay is the same way. The strands represent, I mean, I like to think of them as voices, and, but each voice is distinctly different. Okay, so for example, one strand of a braided essay might be a memoir where it's written in first person. It's very introspective, it's very personal. Another strand is really different. It might be a piece of really hardcore research about something, some historical research. And the third strand might be a list, like a found object. The thing that links all these things together are, th are themes, okay? So in a braided essay, the writer has multiple threads or through lines of material and then the essay itself is broken into sections. So each section that is, is part of that braid. And you, st you sort of stagger the different threads of your essay in a way where the juxtaposition of the, of the strands is, creates surprising instances. Maybe, maybe even draws, makes, makes connections that you didn't, you didn't even see when you wrote the original strands. And so it's a way of incorporating surprise and even, even self-surprise, if, uh, if that's even a concept. And so it allows the writer to create, but also to learn. Um, so so it's, it's, it's almost like a, a, it's lyrical. It's like it's, it's the linearity of the piece is not as important as the thematic echoing of the different strands. And so the, these essays do require a bit of, of forethought before you start writing. So you get the concept. And these are some, some of the things that other people who have written, because braided essays are kind of a thing right now, like these, these uh, it's called personal narrative or creative nonfiction or lyrical nonfiction. It's this more loose, artistically oriented type of essay. And I gotta say, as a creative writer, it's something that suits my style a lot. So you can cast the light on things side by side, like I just said, which totally makes sense to me. Also, you have to find a more circuitous way into your topic. You're not just diving right in and saying, this is what I think and this is why I think that. You're doing a kind of circling around it, which is really different. It's a really different approach. And you, you must expand your peripheral vision, so you're actually focusing on different things rather than the, the sort of central subject at hand. And then, this is the one I really like. The braided form expands the conversation, presses upon the hard lines of ideology, stretch the choices beyond right or left, blah, 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 blah. So it's this idea of stepping back, loosening up, and having a slightly different focus. Roxane Gay, the feminist, essayist, superwoman, fantastic writer, has a blog, and she does this really cool thing where she juxtaposes recipes, because she loves to cook, with these personal stories about her life. They're completely unrelated, and then incidental things that happen to her during the day. And she's a super huge intellectual, so she's just kind of like bopping in and out with this amazing intellectual eye, but then she's also talking about the tomatoes she just made yesterday. So you get like little recipes and stuff, but she intentionally throws it all together in this mixture. So, you know, if you don't like one part of the braid, you can skip to the next. I like them all with her, so. So I definitely recommend that, um, that you check her out. So my essay for this particular conference is called The Fire Triangle. Like I said, it's got three elements correspond with the three braids. Now, I may, I may put more strands in there, and I'm interested in expanding it beyond just writing and bringing in music and art and making like a multimedia installation because I'm just sort of into that these days. So, but right now, this is sort of the, the writerly part of it. And I'm fascinated with a memoir about transformational disaster. And I call it that because I was a college student in 89 during the Loma Prieta earthquake. And I remember that it, I mean, it quite literally shook me. Uh, it shook me out of habits that I had, I, I had been just sort of blindly adhering to up until that point in college. It, it actually turned me into kind of a different person. And I, it, to this day, still am struggling with, with understanding what happened to me at that point. And so I'm, I'm kind of interested in writing about that. But then I'm also, I also, in, in, incidentally, the Loma Prieta earthquake was, epi, the epicenter was where I live right now. So it's kind of this bizarre connection. But another, another point of, of connection with me is the way that the redwood forest in my neighborhood was logged right after the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. 
Because if you see the Victorian houses that are there today, the wooden houses, those were all built out of redwoods from where I live. Um, and I have massive stumps in my yard that my kids can climb inside. And they were just, they came in there and just clear cut everything about 100 years ago for that. So I'm kind of interested in that as a piece of historical research, because people don't really write about that so much. And then the list that I'm interested in is how to build an illegal fire, which is actually something that I wrote as a note to myself a few years ago. And I'll read a little bit of that now if you're interested, because I'm actually really good at making illegal fires. <laughs> okay, so this, this is really short. It's not, I'm, I'm still working on this. Um, Okay, so this section is called The Backyard Burden Season is Approaching. What can fire teach us, this thing that needs to happen but also shouldn't happen? And how do we live in the middle of it and be outside of it at the same time? How do we not make it into a self-serving argument, a fable of sorts? The logger cites the overabundance of flammable material. White collars complain about blue collars stumping, dumping oleander cuttings on their side of the road. We all want things better, but for whom? Each of the rules is insurmountable. Five acres that have been neglected for about 100 years. Area is large. Trees are large. There's no water. There's no way to put out an uncontrolled fire. We are cash poor. Every year, more dead wood. There are about 30 oh shit seconds when you start an illegal fire. When the bay branches you put aside six months prior go up, crackling and oily almost simultaneously, and the flames are shooting up well over your head, singeing the lowest needles on the redwood tree above, and you wonder if maybe the pile was too big after all, and whether your nearest neighbor was home in case you needed help. But what the hell could they even do? Those seconds tick by until the hunger of the fire subsides, and it just becomes a regular fire, an extra large campfire, and you begin to throw the duff around you into it. You need to know the scope, and guess what? The scope is too big, even for you. Even if you make a mistake and burn the forest down, your life is fucked anyway, so why not do it? This is a difficult ethical situation, and I'm afraid I've made a very selfish choice. I will improve my property at the risk of destroying everything. I will light a fire that may help to prevent future fires from starting in the same place, but may also, may also escape my control and burn everything down. Do I light the match? Do I take the risk? And if I'm caught, am I contrite? When the rest of the mountain burns, but our place does not because of our illegal burns, are we righteous? What need keeps me scheming about where to put my piles and making my list of best practices for an illegal burn? You burn and your neighbor doesn't. Everything still burns. Every time there's a forest fire and your house doesn't burn, your house becomes less likely to burn in the future. How much should be burned and how much should be left? So that's one, one little section. Um, I'm not going to read you my list of how to behave during an, an illegal fire, except the key word is paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my panel, another big jumble of words. I, I'm doing this with some of my colleagues, actually my friends from the University of Houston. We're all poets. We all happen to be chairs of our departments. We all live in different bioregions, which is really cool. I was hoping to get somebody from Texas, too, because we don't have the South in there. But my friend Barbara Duffy is at Dakota Wesleyan University, which I spelled wrong, um, up in North Dakota, I believe. I think it's North. And then my friend Yvonne Murphy, who, who's SUNY Empire State. So we've got the East, we've got the West, and we've got the North. Um, and that's the best I could do. Um, we will be presenting our braided essays, and we may attempt to braid them together into one big crazy jumble. I'll be happy if I just finish this one in a way that I'm happy with. But um, if you like, I have an example of a braided essay just for your information that I think is really cool that um, I think students would actually really like as well because it is what we call an Ars Poetica. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an essay about essays. So it's an, it's, it helps you write. Did I do that? I'm pretty much do okay. done. So I think I'm done. I only have 20 of these, but happy to send you more. I'm not going to read through this because it's really long, but it's all about eating. I don't know why, but writers like to inter 
interspose uh, recipes and things like that. But anyway, thanks so much for coming, and I'm happy to to address anything you you want to talk about. So I'll be moderating the Q and A part um, of this section. Um, I was just just going to start off with a couple of questions for Dr. Chisholm, and then open the floor up to uh, questions that you might have. Um, so, based on our conversations, and based on um, your talk here, I actually wanted to discuss this rated essay concept more. Yeah. From my vantage point as an engineer, it's really interesting because it's sort of the same idea as a collaboration, where you get a grant, but you kind of throw it to three or four different labs, and you see how it all sort of stitches together at the end. And so, I guess for starters, what brought you to the idea of, of creating a rated essay? I feel like it's probably something you haven't done before, and this is a first go at it. In some ways, I think all of my academic work up until this point has been a braided essay, whether I like it or not. I'm not particularly good at sounding profound in my intellectual endeavors. So, you know, it's, it's almost, it is kind of paradoxical. Like maybe if I back up a little bit and, and try not to intentionally sound like I know what I'm doing, maybe I'll sound like I know what I'm doing a little bit more. And oddly enough, it seems to work for me. So. <laughs> That was, that was one of the things. I mean, to actually find out that like, the way that I approach an essay is a form, is <laughs> an actual thing, it was, really, it was really kind of cool. So um, I think you know, we spend a lot of our time trying to imitate what sounds intelligent, right? We try to sound like you know, the, the, the voices we read or the, the words that we see in academic journals. And I think what goes along with that is an assumption that that is the only way to write. And it really isn't. It really isn't. I mean, if you read any of the best American essays that come out, you'll see there's a sort of variety of types, and many of them kind of adhere to this sort of aesthetic. It's, it's pretty interesting. It's a, it's a new thing, and it's not going to be loved by everyone, but, but I think it works for me. Uh, I guess my second question then is, so going through this process and having run through it, um, particularly the, the integration bit or the collaboration bit um, with your colleagues, um, what's been, what have you found to be the most challenging and most maybe insightful lesson you've got from it so far? So far, it's identifying the strands. I think that that has the, been the hardest part for me because my own strands, yeah, okay, that's hard enough. But then when you think about two other people writing in two other bioregions, to try to look for ways that you might weave your own writing together, like then you don't want to overprescribe it. Um, but you really, have to, you really have to kind of nail those concepts, right? So is it apocalypse that we're going to sort of riff on? Is that something that we use to braid? Or is it a paradox? I mean, is it a concept like that? Or is it a, or is it a real thing, you know, like a, a tree, for example? Just setting up that framework and yeah. getting it. Yeah, because my apocalypse is not the same as Yvonne's. Yvonne's having some issues with flooding, which I'm sure we would really appreciate a little bit more of here. Um, she's, yeah, so I mean, I don't think, I think we're going to have to think about these things a little bit differently um, when, we, when we think about how we're going to set this up. I mean, the concept itself is kind of huge in this. It's an interesting collaboration. Yeah. Interesting and, and you know what? It might not work. We might have three braids, which I think would be OK. Um, I think at some point, the, the people who listen to our talks and listen to our papers are going are gonna to hear things echoing, you know, whether we intentionally braid them together or not. You know, we're starting out with a, with a framework that we're trying to agree on. And from where we go from there is going to be a whole different thing. I mean, the element of randomness is important. You don't want it to be uh, overprescribed. So that's, that's tough. Well, it definitely allows for your creativity to, I mean, all of you have the same kind of goal towards addressing and communicating the challenges of climate change. So um, it'll be interesting to see how those perspectives mesh. Yeah. Um, open the floor to questions at this point. Yeah. So I have a question. Uh, when I was listening to your talk, it's the first time ever I hear No. Oh, okay. um, I'm, I'm finding so many of these things now because people didn't used to call these braided essays. They were just called lyrical essays or they weren't really classified. So, so now people are going back and, and pulling things out. Like, I don't know if that's, you know. Well, I was hoping you had, uh, you, you, you knew about that. No, but I mean, I, I, every day I'm finding new ones.
Mm -hmm. He has uh, other chapters that, in order to make any sense of, you, when you're reading along, you have to you figure out that you have to skip every other line, right? Oh. And, and then you read one story, and then you read the other story, and you skip. Instead, you have a different story. Yeah. And there is options on how to read that book. And there's a map by which you start reading these um, uh, chapters in, in, in weird orders. And if you do it that way, <laughs> you have a story that you read. Or you have a headache. Way, Yeah. Well, you definitely think about braids, like you can think of braids in terms of the strands as being as thick as sections of, of prose, or you can think of them as being as thin as, as lines, like say in a poem. Um, it depends how tight you want the braid to be, I suppose, or how, how intricate you want it to be. And I think for me, I get the sense that there's a point where no one's going to want to need like a, you know, like a, a key to decode everything that I'm saying. <laughs> Um, you've got to make it readable, I suppose. And so, you know, if you really like, the writer's got to be really good to, be, to do something that conceptual and, and to follow along. But, but to me, it's a puzzle. It's like, it's like making a puzzle, and I, I, I'm fascinated by that. Um, because I think it also it gratifies the part of me that loves to organize, but then, it, but then it, it's just by design makes me have to throw that all away, too, and just go, just, you know, be spontaneous. No, for sure. When I first started reading that book, I, I wasn't prepared for it, so right. I had to put it aside and pick it up again at a different time. Yeah. I, was open. My, I felt my mind was open enough to, to really dive into it and flow with it, which is very, very different from anything I've ever read before and since. Yeah. yeah. I, love, I love it. Yeah. I was thinking about something you said early in the talk about creativity. I think what, it was the slide where you said, if my neighbor's house is burning, or burned, and mine didn't, is it right for me to celebrate? And I wrote, does creativity equal celebration? Because I thought, huh, I don't know that, I mean, yes, but isn't it so much more? You know, isn't it? Isn't there a kind of a persuasive element? Oh yeah. In terms of the creative result, doesn't mm -hmm. it persuade with its? Yeah, I suppose, I suppose that I, I looked at it from a very selfish angle, like what do I get out of this? So that was my question, do you see creativity, is that your framework for creativity, I guess, as a, as a celebration? Well, that's a good question. I think that's definitely, I would like it to be that. I don't think that's usually what it ends up being for me. Um, but I think the older I get, the more I can see the wisdom. And, and you know, if you're going to sit down and do something, you should, there should be a good reason for it, right? Um, if I'm just going to focus on the apocalypse, what's the point? You know, why? Um, I guess I thought, well, if you describe the apocalypse, might it persuade others to action? I guess I, I often see, I, I'm someone who sees fiction as having a rhetorical mm -hmm. impact. Mm -hmm. So, and, but of course, celebration is sort of just, is that, I guess, in the realm of like aesthetics for its own sake? Yeah. Yeah, it's self help sometimes. Um, so yes, I guess in that sense it is a celebration. <laughs> so yeah. So sort of to leapfrog off of that, I guess like as a scientist and thinking about how we communicate tends to be a very linear and prescribed and also from one vantage point. But with this braided kind of concept, I guess my thought is if we as academics were better at having sort of a braided approach to how we communicate, especially with the world external to academia, if that might be a way of overcoming the resistance to say reading like technical work as mm. well, right? So if you have creative aspects to that, you know, sort of interlaced with these scientific, you know, scholarly. Yeah, a couple of things about that. I mean, you definitely catch more flies that way in terms of your audience, right? Yeah. Um, but also, I think one thing that I, I don't know if it was in this, this essay that I handed out, but, but there's this idea that, that the, the spaces between the ideas are where real discovery occurs. And that is true for science a lot of the times, where you have two people, two, two researchers speaking, and, and, and in between what they say, there's this area where, where the real discovery is. And I keep thinking, yes, I want that to be me. I want that to be where my discovery is as well. And so. How do you do that? You've got to create these spaces within your own mind. Um, 
So I often, in my creative writing class, my students will write something and I'll say, did you mean that to be, did you have that, did you know this element was going on in your, in your story? Did you know that the sub, subplot was happening? And they'd be like, no. And then they go, but I guess it was. And then later on they come back and say, you know, I guess I knew I always wanted to write about that, but I really didn't know it consciously. And I keep thinking, that's what you need to exploit. That's what I want to exploit myself as well. And sometimes you have to fool yourself <coughs> into discovery, which is really crazy to think that you might not even know what you know. <laughs> so. Yes? We're just, just wondering if this is kind of a, a self-collaboration yourself? Definitely. Like a singular person, but kind of letting the multiple aspects of yourself kind of come together and mm -hmm. like analytical mind and then your, your memory components and that I mean, ideas, you know, spread between people that don't belong to any one person, but also within your own yes. mind are these kind of schisms and so and voices, right? I mean, like, like as a poet, you're kind of you're kind of moved, pushed toward this lyrical voice, this voice that's based in song. And that works in some areas, right? Like you're writing about love, a lot of times a lyrical, a lyrical voice will help, but then a lot of times you've got another voice inside of you, it's usually like the cynic. It's like, shut up, you sap. <laughs> and you don't wanna just dwell over there either, so you wanna have kind of a dialogue between the two where you're balancing it out. And so I think, I think for me, like, I spend a lot of time pushing that voice down or bringing it up way too much, and I'm, I'm really trying to, to, to see how the voices interact a little bit more. So, yeah. I don't know, I mean, a lot. <laughs> I also feel like that this works against the idea that like there's there's creativity and then there's like academic thought and a lot of people like pose or do not just the humanities, but like, oh I have this creative part of me about like teaching it's and useless. writing for journals works a different part of my brain and there's just no space for that anymore. And I really like labors alone, right, in our, like, we'll just have a creative moment alone, like, I mean, I'm so interested in what's going to happen, presenting this to other people, having that element of both collaboration and randomness, you don't know what people are going to hear and what they're going to tell you, be part of the, yeah, you don't, you just don't know, you don't know, it could fall flat, you know, yeah. So yeah, that's why getting there is supposed to be half the fun, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it could fall flat, but you know, what did I learn? What did I get out of it? And hopefully it won't fall flat. So, yes? I'm just kind of curious about the great pair of two things for each strand. Mm -hmm. I think it's the easiest yeah. metaphor. <laughs> Yeah, now my daughter this morning said, but mommy, if you do a fishtail braid, there are four strands. <laughs> and I was like, I know. <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, two, I think two would be fine too, you know? I don't, I don't think, I think it's, I think. The one, the one I gave you starts out wanting to be two or three, and then it just starts bringing in Joseph Cornell and starts bringing in all this other stuff, and I'm like, what the hell, who cares? Yeah. Yeah, or it's or it's a uh, you know it's a uh, it's it's more like a tapestry or something. I don't. I'm not. I just my brain starts to hurt after a while, so I don't. I think I can handle about three, personally. Yes. I was struck by something one of your slides says of the role of white space in these great essays. Yeah. Um, it made me think a lot about more uh, like poetry. Yep. Poetry uses it to bring it back to. Sure. Um, I can, yeah. I mean, usually what I tell my students is that when you get to an end of a line of poetry and there's a line break, that signifies a breath. Like there's a, there's a, t there's a tendency to write, like iambic pentameter is just about what we can say in one breath. So there's a reason why a lot of stuff is written in that meter, because it's, it, it is just sort of the natural way that we speak, and we also speak in iams too, right? So. So there's that, it was, was not a random thing. But the white space, I think, has to do with telling the reader where to pause and also 
telling them where to just like cleanse the mental palate before you move on to the next one, or even to consider the, the, the transition between the two. So, I mean, I think it's a really, really important part of the piece. And I think as a poet, I'm really sensitive to, to that stuff. Um, you know, I think about like, should my chunks in the braid be like this thick or should they be this? Should I do these kind of alternating things? And it really does affect the way the reader reads it. So I like to think of white space as your telegraphing intent to the reader and a lot of it to intent uh, in, in terms of speed and pausing and how fast you want them to go. And you can make it really difficult for a reader to get through a page of text just by the way you break the line and how many white spaces you stick in there. So, uh, yeah, it's important to me. Also, typographic uh, devices like uh, italics. Like you might put one section completely in italics. You might indent it a lot. Um, as long as you're consistent, it's a language you're speaking to your reader. Um, and I'm not interested in, in making it more complicated, but I do, uh, but I'm not, not disinterested in challenge either, if that makes sense. So, so I like to mix it up a bit. Margot. So at each of these talks, there's always someone who says, but what about maritime? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be that person this time. Because as you were talking, I was thinking about my visit to the Knot Club, which is a tutored session of the Marlin class. I should have just used the Knot metaphor. <laughs> The, you know, the, the tied up in knots part of the knot metaphor is, just seems a little <laughs> constricting. And I, was, I was thinking about the, um, <laughs> yes. I was thinking about the, the so with Marlon Spike, there's like, there's the, the, the function and the um, utilitarian aspect of it, but then there's also this highly decorative aspect to it. And so it's, it's kind of that, I don't know. The, the this is like, this is like macrame. Yeah. <laughs> so that kind of knot that's useful but also pretty. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I could put a ship in there if you want. <laughs> but I was also thinking about because when I visited the, the knot club, they were, they were having, uh, some, they were trying to figure out what to, what to use as kind of an anchor for the mask to, to develop, you know, and, and like with friendship bracelets or whatever, you kind of tie and tape things down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another term in there, but is, is there like a? I think that that, that the metaphor of whatever that is, this anchoring thing, we were talking about that with the older collaborators. Mm -hmm. of that too. Similar. Yeah. I Analogous. Think where, I, where I was going with that, but it just um, I was thinking that these are. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean. Hmm. I think the you know like she in this essay uses the hala bread as her braid, which is sounds better to me than rope. <laughs> but uh, you know, I don't know. I think you just you pick a structure, right? And you pick something that, that looks like that structure to remind yourself of what you're doing. And I don't know. It could I guess it could be that. I, I think I'm a little knotted out, a little shipped out at the moment. <laughs> so I'm choosing the braid. But yeah, I mean. Fire, I guess, I could think about the maritime aspect of fire. I kind of don't want to right now, so. <laughs> Sorry, sailors. <laughs> Anything else? Are we done? Oh my God, we're done. We're so done. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.